Well, you know what that music means, that hard rocking Madison Rising music. That means it's time for another soon to be award winning episode of Student of the Gun Radio. And this week we are back in our home studios. That's right. We're in our same comfortable chairs behind our black carbon steel Student of the Gun microphones. Now, last week we were at the NRA annual meeting and exhibits in Houston, Texas. We had a fantastic weekend and I want to make sure that I take a moment here to thank everybody who came out. All the folks who stopped by during the book signings or while we were on the floor or just, you know, saw us in the hallway or the aisles and said, hey, Student of the Gun Radio. Uh, we really appreciate all of you guys out there. And they broke a record this year. It was, I think the previous attendance record for an NRA annual meeting was around 72,000, which is a lot of bodies over a three-day weekend. Well, I saw the numbers this last week, and they, they tallied, I believe it was 86,000 attendees at the NRA annual meeting in Houston last week. That is fantastic. And what that tells me is it tells me that you guys out there, that you folks are concerned, that you're, you know, excited, that you're motivated, that you're, you really want to protect your Second Amendment and all of your constitutional rights. And I'm glad that they had such a huge attendance. I mean, it was a madhouse. It, re- it really was. But in a good way. Now, Jared, Jared is over there on the other side of the table from me. He's got two monitors going because he is a hardworking guy. Now, Jared, you went to the NRA annual meeting and you came back with some goodies. What did you come back with? Well, as you guys know, Student of the Gun did book signings at NRA show, and we we had one at Caltech on Saturday, I believe. Yeah, it was Saturday morning. Yeah, Saturday morning. And while we were there at the Caltech booth, I picked up one of their CL42 flashlights. And that thing is awesome. Let me tell you, it's got 420 lumens of brightness. It's, it's awesome. Uh, last night I was at a concert. And it was an outdoor concert and it was about 10 o'clock at night. It was dark and I was trying to walk through the crowd and I pulled out the flashlight, turned it on. And this guy pulled me out of the crowd and he's, he asked if I was a cop. And I was like, well, why would you think that? And he's like, well, your flashlight's super bright. And I was like, well, I'm not a cop, but I can be. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, it's, it, it takes your standard, uh, one, two, three lithium batteries. It just takes two of those and it's, it's pretty awesome. You should pick one up. From KeltechWeapons.com. Of, of Cocoa, Florida. Of, of Cocoa, Florida. That's right. Well, Jared, Jared brings up a really good point. Uh, they, that, and I learned this years ago. When it's dark and there's an emergency, the person with the flashlight is de facto in charge. Uh, many, I mean, many years ago, like 20 some years ago, I was working as a professional bodyguard. I was in a hotel in the Caribbean or Caribbean, depending on where you're from. <laughs> and, uh, the power went out. Well, when, what happens in hotels when the power goes out? Well, the, uh, the fire, the doors, the emergency doors let loose and close and, uh, the alarm goes off. Ding, ding, ding. So I get up, I grab a flashlight. Now, this is way back before uh, I was hip to all the, you know, the, the new Caltech lights or Surefire or Stream lights or what have you. I had a big old mag light. So I grabbed the mag light, I pulled my pants on, and I went out in the hallway to see what was going on. And all of a sudden, and people are running up to me asking me, what's going on? What should we do? I'm like, I don't know. I'm a guest at this hotel. What do you mean? What should I do? I wasn't working at the hotel, but uh, it occurred to me right at that moment that the person with the flashlight is in charge. Now, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to you, the student of the gun? Well, what it means is if there is some type of emergency, it doesn't have to be a shooting emergency or a crime emergency. It could be your car's broken down by the side of the road and you get out and you're, you're investigating it and you've got a really bright flashlight and you're shining it around. Uh, when people see you, when you see someone at night in the dark and they have a very, very bright flashlight and they're looking around, what do you instantly think? If you didn't, couldn't see the person, if all you could see was a dark silhouette and you saw a bright white light shining around, what do you think? Well, you think it's a cop, right? Because what do police have? Police have really bright flashlights. De facto, the person with the bright light is the person in charge. Does that person with the really bright light searching in the dark, do the youth, if you're a criminal, if you're a bad actor, would you think, hey, that's a, that's a person I want to go and I want to rob. I want to rob that guy right there. No. You think you want to rob the guy that's fumbling around in the dark because he doesn't have any kind of flashlight. 
or illumination device. So, uh, and, we, and we've recommended many times with student on student on TV and in my articles and what have you. If you're going to carry a gun, you need to carry a flashlight. So enough said about that. But yeah, the the Keltec uh, CL42 lights. A lot of people don't know about them. They think, well, Keltec makes you know polymer frame guns and so forth. They have no idea that you know they're a machine company and they have the ability to make a really super bright, tough, and compact enough to slip in your side pocket flashlight. Now, who else? Uh, obviously, right now, I am wearing my crossbreed holster. I've got my Super Tuck on with a G19 in it. I wouldn't leave home without it. And uh, our Firearms Radio Network, we want to take a quick uh, moment to acknowledge Firearms Radio Network for being our bandwidth sponsor. Now, we followed up on the NRA. We had a great time. We appreciate all of you guys coming out. And uh, like I said, we had a fantastic time. We're looking forward to doing it again next year. I believe next year is in Indianapolis, but uh, we'll keep you up to date as that progresses. Now, Jared, we've got a question of the week. Now, you guys remember, if you want to be the student of the week, it's super easy. All you have to do is go to our Facebook page, Student of the Gun on Facebook, and post your question. And if we use your question on the air, we will reward you with an official Student of the Gun t-shirt. Now, Jared, tell us who our Student of the Week is and tell us what their question is. Our student of the week is Clay Dawson, and he wants to know if there's a pistol safe that you would recommend for a nightstand drawer or another strategy for keeping that pistol by the bed. Okay, fantastic, uh, fantastic question. And I think a lot of people, a lot of students of the gun out there in the audience that you, you've some, if you haven't figured it out yet, you may be, you know, trying to tackle that situation. Like, what is the best way for me to have a firearm stored ready for that bump in the night? You know, it's 2.30 in the morning, I'm in a deep sleep crash, the dogs are barking, and I spring up out of bed. Something's going on out there. I need to get a gun in my hand, I need to get a light in my hand. So where should I keep that? A lot of people, for decades and decades, the whole gun under the pillow thing, people stop doing that. Stop, stop doing that. Uh, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's dangerous. It doesn't secure the gun. People are like, Oh, that's bull crap. I've been doing it for 20 years. I've been sleeping with a gun under my pillow. Okay. Great. And tomorrow is going to be the time that you grab it in a deep sleep and end up shooting yourself through the wall, through, through the wall or yourself or what have you. Uh, one of my firearms instructors, and this goes back again about 20 years when I was in the police academy. Uh, he related a story to us about keeping the, the gun in your bed or under your pillow or what have you. And this, uh, this gentleman, he was a, a brand new sheriff's deputy, uh, you know, still wet behind the ears. And he had his, uh, Smith and Wesson 357 Magnum revolver. And he said when he would go to bed at night, he would take it out of his holster. He would set it right on the bed next to him and go to sleep. He said, I did that until I woke up to the sound of gunfire. And I heard the gunfire because there was a gun in my hand. I was sitting up in bed and I shot through my mattress. Folks, don't do it. Uh, and the point that, and what I, what I like to say is you want to, you want to give yourself at least two steps. There should be two steps before you access the gun. It, it shouldn't just be grabbing it. It should be in a holster, in a container, in a case, something so that you in a, in the fog of, it, you guys have, you're all adults. And if you're not, hey, you'll be an adult someday, but you've all had that. 2 a.m., 3 a.m. fog where you come out of a such a deep sleep, you're like, what time is it? Where am I? What is going on? That is not the time to be putting your, your little booger hook, your digit on the trigger. Uh, what you want to do is you want to, before you can touch that trigger, you should have to go through some type of process. Now, there are those rapid access, uh, gun safes or gun vaults where you punch in and put your hand on it and you punch in a code uh, and it springs open and you stick your hand in there. They've got those. Um, but you also have different types of holsters that you can secure or mount to your bed. And our friends at Crossbreed Holsters have what they call the bedside backup. And essentially it's the same technology that they use to build their, their holsters. Only it's, it's a, you go to, go to crossbreedholsters.com. You can check out the, the pictures and what have you. But the bedside backup it is essentially there's, there's a panel that slips between your mattress and your box spring. It's got, you know, hook and loop Velcro lining and you take the holster you secure it to that, take your gun, put it in there, drape the bedspread over it. And when the bedspread's there, nobody's the wiser. It's just there. And what, now, what I do is I actually take my Glock 19. Where's the best place to secure your gun, Jared? 
your body. Exactly. On your body. You know, people are like, well, where should I put my gun? And my answer is put it on your body. If it's attached to your body, you have control of it. Anytime you take it off and set it down anywhere, you don't have control of it. But obviously you don't sleep with a gun. So when, you know, when I'm done for the night, I'm all done. You know, I'm taking my clothes off. I take the Glock 19 out of the holster that's on my body and I put it directly into the bedside backup holster, which is on my bed. And uh, so that gun, the G19, is always in one of two places. It's either, if it's not attached to my body, it's in the bedside backup. And if it's not in the bedside backup, it's attached to my body. So you mean if you go to New York and you've got or or a gun free zone and you've got a uh, a gun on you, you don't want to take it off and and put it on a couch, stick it under the couch cushions. <laughs> That's yeah. Jared's doing a reference back to uh, one of our previous episodes where a uh, a uh, a non enlightened person decided to take off their gun and tuck it up under the uh, couch cushions. <laughs> no, no, you don't want to do that, Jared. You don't want to stick your gun under the couch cushions. I was just making sure. Yeah. Yeah, and, and if you're one of those those on off people, and you know what I'm talking about, you're constantly all day long taking your gun out of your holster, put it in back in, out, in, out, in. You're gambling. You're you're gambling because what you're going to do is you're going to take that gun off sometime. Uh, you see this? I don't know what it is about actors. Jared, in, in movies, they're constantly detectives, you know, the detective, he, he comes off the street and he walks into his office. And what is the first thing the damn detective does on the, on the TV or on the radio in the mo- or the movies, right? He pulls out his, he opens his desk drawer, takes his gun off, puts it in his desk drawer and closes it. Who does that? People on, t- on the movies do, you know, on TV and the movies. That's what, that's what they do. Real people, real cops don't take their freaking guns off every, like five times a day. Put it on, leave it alone. It'll be fine. Every time you handle a gun in a non-tactical uh, or administrative uh, way, method, you're inviting disaster. Stop doing it. So the answer to your question, Clay, where should I keep my gun at night? Well, if you've got little kids and you're worried about little kids accessing your gun, you're going to need to get some kind of a secure device, such as the gun vault or one of those rapid access vaults, something like that, or just put it up high where a little kid can't reach it. But you should, regardless what you do, it should always be in some type of a holster, a container, something that is securing it. Leaving guns just laying around, uh, you know, on dressers, under pillows, what have you, is a recipe for disaster. You Because you're not, it's not so much you're worried about other people, you're worried about what you're going to do in that crash fog adrenaline dump, you know, at three o'clock in the morning when the dogs are going crazy, you come up out of a deep sleep and you snatch that thing up. And if your first action is snatching up a naked gun, it might just go boom when you don't want it to go boom. So put it in something, put it in a holster, in a container, what have you. And if you're going to do it, do it in the same way all the time. Uh, that is, brings up another good point. People who are continuously changing their holster carry method or where they stage it method, that's nuts. Put it in the same, pick a good place, pick a good spot, and do that all the time so that you don't have to stop and think, hey, where's my gun today? Because we don't have guns. They're, they're not toys. They're personal defense tools. That'd be like taking your fire extinguisher and, like, moving it all around the house so that at you know, each day it's in a different spot. When the house is on fire, you don't want to have to play the where did we put the extinguisher game, right? So same, enough said. Now, folks, if, if you haven't been watching Student of the Gun TV, if you haven't gone to studentofthegun.com to watch the episodes, you're missing out. You really are. You're missing out on a good portion of the free training that we offer you guys every single week. Now, and you may not know, but we do, uh, we started doing a student of the gun homeroom segments. Now the homeroom segments are essentially their short form videos. I pick one topic. I talk about that topic. We give you a little free lesson and we put them up every Thursday and Sunday on student of the gun.com. And then every Tuesday we put the new episode of the show. If you're familiar with student of the gun, you know that we've been, you know, we started out on pursuit channel on dish network and direct TV and so forth. We were on the sportsman's channel, uh, dish and direct, but the entire time we were on satellite and cable, people were constantly asking us, 
why can't I watch your show online or where can I go online to watch your show? And there were little clips and little short snippets and stuff, but you know, the quality, there was not a quality high definition show student of the gun on the, on the internet, you know? So what we did last year is I've, I've got an, uh, a partner, Charles, Charles is my buddy, Charles, if you're listening, thank you very much. Uh, he helped me completely redesign the website and so what we're able to do is put student of the gun TV, put our shows and they're, they're produced just like they were, you know, two years ago, but now you can watch them for free. You don't have to have dish direct cable, nothing. If you have the internet, if you can access the internet, you can watch student of the gun TV. So make sure that you're taking advantage of that. Now the next one. Oh my Lord. Oh, and don't forget when you go to uh student of the uh, they're over on the uh, right hand side. There's a little sign up form. It's for our, our digital newsletter. And we do frequently uh, our, our good sponsors. The uh, we, we give stuff away. Uh, we we've given away holsters. We've given away guns. We've given away ammunition, uh, all kinds of, uh, of goodies. And when we do our, our contests, the people that are eligible are all our active subscribers. So if you are an active subscriber to student of the gun, you know, you, you fill out the little form and we won't spam you. We don't like spam either. We're not going to sell your address to anybody, but that's how you can win. That's how you're eligible is you go to student of the gun.com. You sign up for the weekly newsletter. It tells you what's new on the TV show what the most recent article is, and then, of course, what's going on with Student of the Gun Radio. So it, it's free. It's easy. You know, if you're not taking advantage of it, you're missing out. <laughs> the next topic we've got up here is called Morons on Parade. And uh, Jared's shaking his head because he can't believe that this next story was actually true. Now, last week, we talked about the uh the the Oregon school teachers or the Oregon uh teacher staff they were having a, a staff meeting and uh somebody in the, the staff members decided it would be a cool idea to put on you know ski masks and walk into the teachers meeting with blank firing guns to just open fire to to show the the seriousness of taking you know an active shooter seriously that or we talked about that that's craziness well we've got another one and this is as crazy, if not crazier than the first one. It seems everybody, if you're paying attention to pop culture, you know that Iron Man 3 was released last week. Okay, big movie. Everybody's excited about it. So in order to kick it off, what they did uh, at a... What, where, what city in Missouri was this? Jefferson City, Missouri. The theater manager of the... Senate Movies 8, Capital 8 Theaters. There we go. Capital 8 Theaters in Jefferson City, Missouri, decided it would be a good idea to hire some actors to portray movie characters and have them go into the theater. Well, some of the actors were dressed like, and if you, if you know the Iron Man series or the, the series, if you don't, I'll, I'll just stick with me, dressed like SWAT cops, Base, but in all black with, the, with you know uh, load-bearing vests and guns. So uh, Genius here decided it would be a, a fun idea to have somebody dressed in all black with a, a load-bearing vest and a fake gun walk into the movie theater during the premieres, the premiere of Iron Man 3. Yes, a human being, a homo sapien in the United States of America thought that would be a good, a fun idea. Okay, I don't need to tell you what happened in Aurora, Colorado, and how was that nut job dressed, Jared? Just like a, just like they were, just like this guy in all black, you know. So your idea of a fun time of entertainment is hiring an actor, dressing him up in all black, giving him a fake rifle, and telling him to go into the theater. And and my question is, what actor in their right mind would have done that? Exactly. exactly. What. What what kind, I mean what kind of a, a freaking there's too much stupid in the water down there um, in Jefferson City apparently who thinks that this is a good idea and it's not like it was a spur of the moment thing they had to plan and get costumes and what's even crazier all right the police were called uh, the SWAT teams were you called out it was I mean it was it was a mess well the this guy right here, the theater manager, Bob Wilkins, stay away from Bob Wilkins. He's not an intelligent person. 
just based upon this story. That's what I know. When w, uh, ABC 17 asked Wilkins if he had any regrets after it was over, quote, he says, no, my job is to entertain people. What? Entertain people? So you're thinking that I'm going to dress a guy up like a, a mass murderer, like an active shooter, and I'm going to send him into a movie theater less than six months after the Aurora, uh, uh, you know, carnage. That's a good idea. Well, what we need to ask ourselves, and then we're going to get back on track for student of the gun. All right, number one, that was stupid. But number two, we've got some people out there, and you, and you guys in the audience, a lot of you, uh, if you live in free America, you are probably an armed citizen. You, you probably are responsible, and you carry a firearm when you go out and about, even to a movie theater. Now, you say to yourself, well, what would have happened if I would have been in a theater sitting there with my family and some jackhole walks in dressed all in black and he's got a, a rifle and starts pointing it at people. What do you do? Well, if you pull out your gun and shoot this idiot, people have said to me, oh, man, that would have been a, ter a tragedy. Well, mm, yeah, it would have been a tragedy for the idiot in the in the uniform but like yeah but then i would be in trouble i would be liable i would be you know murder charges or you know no stop yourself this is what you need to understand and you know many many moons ago when i went through the uh, constitutional law and uh, the justifiable use of force when i was in the academy uh, was laid out to us like this your actions will be judged can only lawfully or legally be judged by the information that you had at that moment in time. Now, even though I hate the term reasonable man, there is a, there is a legal precedent called the reasonable man theory that what would a reasonable man who was in possession of the same facts or the same information that you had at that moment in time, how would that person have acted? And we need to go back to what are the big three for justifiable use of force. There's the ability, the opportunity, and jeopardy or intent. So you say, does the person who's potentially going to harm me have the ability? Yes, he's he's got a gun. I see it. All right. Does he have the opportunity to use it? Well, if someone has a rifle and you can see them and they can see you, yes, the opportunity is there. And then you have to say, well, what is the intent or am I in jeopardy? Well, how does that work? And the demonstrated intent is the big one is what is this person doing? You know, if somebody has, you know, if they're walking down the side of a country road and they have uh, a rifle on a sling over their shoulder, yeah, they have the ability and the opportunity, but they don't have the intent to shoot you. You can't just pull it, jump out of your car and gun this dude down because he's walking down the side of the road. So the intent is the big thing. Now, how do you demonstrate intent? If someone, if you see someone with a gun, they point it directly at you, does, is that demonstrated intent? If you're just going about your business, you know, you're walking to your car or you're sitting in a movie theater and a guy walks in, picks up a rifle and points it at your wife, is that demonstrated intent? Do you have to wait for that person to pull the trigger and splatter your wife's brains all over the theater before you do anything? The answer is no. You do not have to wait. You know, don't this whole, uh, you, you don't shoot until they shoot first. That's insanity. It's get that out of your head. So let's say Jared has a question for me. No, I was going to say that's only the truth if you're in our military right now. Yeah, only in the military, you have to wait until right now, uh, if you guys don't know what's going on in Afghanistan, uh, they have to wait until the bad guys shoot at them first, and then they're allowed to return fire. Uh, it's craziness, but I digress. Uh, so let's, let's just say, let's go ahead and play devil's advocate here. Let's say that someone was lawfully carrying, they're in the theater, and this clown walks in because the, th the movie theater manager hired him to dress like a, you know, a killer and walk into the theater. He walks in and he start and he like and he's really into it. P picks up his fake gun and starts pointing at people in the audience. You're like, oh crap! It's like Aurora. You jump up, pull out your pistol, bam, and you hammer this dude, and he's down. And then it all shakes out and it's over with. And they're like, it was a fake gun. It wasn't real. He was an actor. He couldn't have killed you if he wanted to. And then you're supposed to feel bad. No, stop. 
You are not judged by what you knew after the fact. You're not judged by what your actions are not judged by what they found out the next day. Oh, police officers. There have been many police officers who've been involved in justifiable shootings were a bad guy. Uh, A good friend of mine up in Ohio, a guy named Greg Elifritz, uh, he works in Ohio, and they did a study on their department of guns that were seized or taken off of criminals, of bad people. And they found that somewhere around, I think Greg said it was like 27 to 30 percent of the guns that they took off of bad guys were either inoperable in some way, they were not loaded properly, as in there was a magazine in it, but the chamber was empty, or they were loaded with the incorrect ammunition, with the wrong ammo. And so essentially, he said about almost a third of the guns that they were taken off of bad guys Really, if the bad guy would have wanted to kill you with it, he couldn't have because it was either broken, not loaded correctly, or loaded with the wrong ammo. And so the question becomes is, well, if you're a cop and a guy points a gun at you and you drill him, you lay him out, and the the uh, evidence techs and the forensics you know, guys go back and they take the gun apart and they're like, oh, well, this gun, this gun was broken. It couldn't have fired. So you are – and so the question becomes, well – is the just is the shooting bad? Is it a bad shooting? Is it not? No, you could not have known that. Or let's say it was empty. So, uh, people do this all the time. Crazy people or distraught people or desperate people will take an unloaded shotgun or an unloaded rifle, and they'll walk around menacing, pointing it at people, knowing that some that the police are going to show up really soon and shoot them down. That's called suicide by cop, and it happens more often than you may than you may know. But uh, and they say, well, if he had an empty gun and I shot him down, then I'm responsible. No, you do not have to wait until the person pulls the trigger because one round could be the round that kills you. One round could be the round that kills your wife or your child. You don't have to wait. What you have to do is you have to examine the totality of the circumstances. And you need to be able to look in the mirror and say, did I check off those blocks? Ability, check. Opportunity, check. Intent. What is this person's intent? And, you know, if you feel like if you're confident in your skills and your ability, you draw down and you scream, drop it, stop. And I got to believe that this that this actor person probably would have let go of this fake gun and and peed down his leg. Um, But let's say he's he's into it and he turns on you and points the gun at you and you hammer him. Who is responsible for that person's injury and or death? Is it you or is it that person? It's their actions that brought them to that conclusion. So, you know, th- these stories, although you know, you shake your head and you say, man, that's just, that's ridiculous. That's stupid. But they could have ended much worse. It, it, it could have been much worse uh, than it did. And, and this, this dude, this theater manager, sweet Buddha, if you guys live in Jefferson City, Missouri, you got to be asking yourself, What's in the water down there? You know, and I, I mean, if I lived in a city where someone did that, I'd be kind of embarrassed. Uh, I'd say this, it, it's crazy to me. If this dude still has his job come tomorrow, I don't even know. There's no hope for America. Anybody that that's that stupid. Uh, he needs to not be around people. We had a, a uh, another, uh, Another uh, question that came in, or it wasn't really so much a question; it was more of a comment uh, that came in uh, on the uh, on Facebook this this week. And uh, one one of our uh, one of our uh, students of the gun, one of you guys wrote in. You said we need to change the term "gun" or "firearm." We need to stop saying "gun," and we need to start say and substitute the word "self defense tool." Every time we write or talk about a firearm, we should substitute it with the word self-defense tool. And the, the, uh, the thought behind that was, well, that will kind of, that'll disarm or that'll throw the anti-gun hounds off the scent and they won't be able to deal with it. They're like, they won't be able to attack us because we have self-defense tools. And that would be a good way of thinking about it if we didn't know this or if we didn't have evidence to the contrary. Folks, it is the self-defense tool that is exactly what the state doesn't want you to have. And what do you mean, Paul, by the state? Well, if you didn't go to uh, 
public school for the last 20 years and you actually studied history. I studied history. I studied geography. I studied social studies. And you know, it's kind of ironic is when I was in school, I did okay in math and science and so forth. I didn't really excel. I suppose I was about average, you know, and when I got into high school, I wasn't really into calculus and, and all that. But what I was very involved in was history. Uh, I excelled. I, I got believe it or not, all A's and B's uh, in geography, world history, American history, uh, and so forth. And what you need to understand or what you should know if, if you actually ever paid attention to history is throughout the entire history of mankind, so as long as there, you know, when we came out of the caves or the huts or whatever and we started organizing into groups and countries and nations, you've had the state those that are in charge, those that are ruling, and then you have the populace, you have the people. And there's always been, it doesn't matter if you go back to, you know, England or France or Germany or Italy or Japan, or you name it, you always have the state, the organized state, you know, those that are in charge or that want to be in charge of your life. It doesn't matter what the particular government is, whether it's a monarch, um, a monarchy or a theocracy or what have you. You've got the state and then you have the people and there's always been a struggle between the state and the people. That's why there's been so many revolutions over the history, over world history, you know. Uh, unfortunately, what, what happens normally when there's a revolution is you just swap one form of dictatorship for another form of dictatorship. Like, look at, let's look at Russia. You know, they swap the czar for a essentially a communist dictatorship. So they had one guy who was in charge. They didn't like him. They swap it out. Well, you know, it looked good on paper, but it really didn't work out well for them because there's all the state is always there. The state always wants to be in charge. And there's a constant struggle between the state and the population. And historically, uh, go back 100 years, 200 years, 1,000 years, the state usually wins. Well, why does the state win? Well, the state wins because the state is the one with the army, the ones with the guns, the swords, the bows, the spears, the lances, whatever. And, and you know, people like to think that, uh, you know, like murder didn't start in the world history until a gun was invented. You know, war. There was no war until the invention of the gun. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we've been having wars and we've been fighting with each other since we figured out how to pick up a rock or sharpen a stick. That's human nature. Well, human nature is for the state to seek to subjugate the populace. That is how the state survives. That is how though, and don't forget that the state is populated by human beings. They're human beings that make up the state. And in order for them to stay in power, they need for the populace, they need for the citizen to rely upon them. If the citizen doesn't need the state, then the state loses its power. And you say, well, how does this go back to guns and self-defense tools? Well, think about it like this. Uh, 200 years ago, little, you know, in uh, 1791, December 15th, 1791, we ratified the U.S. Constitution, and that included the Bill of Rights. And up to that point in human history, the state could dictate what the citizen could possess as far as arms. You possessed arms at the will of the state. And they would tell you what you could have, what you could not have, whether you could do it with permission. There were certain, there's always been certain people that were allowed to possess arms. And we, we get all, you know, focused on guns, you know, bang, bang guns. But the fact of the matter is the state has always regulated arms. And that goes back to swords, bows, crossbows, spears, lances, whatever, whatever your, you know, Dungeons and Dragons freaking, you know, weapon du jour is, the halberd uh, or the mace. But the fact is, is that the peasantry and the populace has always been disarmed. That's always been the, the, uh, the modus operandi of the state is to control that. Well, why is it? Because... If someone is armed, if you have a populace that is armed, then they can challenge the edict of the state, and the state doesn't like that. The state wants to be in charge. Well, what we've got right now in the United States of America is we've come full circle almost to we're back to that point again where the state, the organized state, is attempting to correct what they believe 
are the mistakes or was the mistake, the mistake that was made back in 1791. The current state believes that the populace was given too much freedom and that the state was given too little freedom. And they're taking steps right now to correct that. And you say, well, come on, Paul, you're paranoid. What, what have you been drinking in your water? Well, I'll tell you what I've been drinking. I've been drinking up facts. Uh, it's not a conspiracy theory when it's actually happening. <laughs> if it's actually taking place where you are and where you stand, uh, if you can see it, it's not a conspiracy. Now, what we're talking about, when we talk about self-defense or self-defense tools, we're essentially talking about is the ability to be an independent citizen. If you can provide for your own security, if you have the ability to provide for your own security and your own safety, you don't need the state. You don't need, you know. So what do we have? Let me give you some quick examples. March of 2013, a New York City resident was arrested after he used a handgun to confront a home invader. I'm at home. Guy breaks in. I pull out a gun. I confront the guy. The guy leaves. Well, you think they're going to go hunt this burglar, home invader, robber down, right? No, they arrest the homeowner. Why? Because he had an unlicensed, they charged him with possessing an unlicensed gun. Now, let's dissect that for, real quick for a second. What does unlicensed mean? Does it mean he stole it? Do you mean, does it mean he was illegal? No, no. It meant that he had not received permission from the state to have that gun in his hand. When you get a license, when the state requires you to get a license, the state is requiring you to seek out their permission before you can possess it. Understand that. And if you live in one of these, uh, you know, nut job, you know, uh, states where the state makes you request permission to own a handgun or to get a license, you need to understand that, you know, whether you think that that's the way it's always been or not, or that's the way it is, or that's reasonable, you're requesting permission from the state to possess that. So that's what a license is. So we have that. We've got a gentleman who, and well, why would, why would you have to ask yourself, why would you be more concerned with arresting a homeowner than you would with seeking out and arresting a robber, a home invader, a felon? You're more concerned about arresting a guy who drove off a felon than you are with the felon. Why would that be? Could it be because that person didn't first seek the assistance of the state? What do you mean the assistance of the state? Well, what they want you to do is call 911, hide under your bed, and a representative of the state will come and take care of your problem. Because if you are an independent citizen, you can defend yourself. You don't need the state. You only need the state to come and clean it up later. Let's talk about another one. Okay, we had a, a gentleman, uh, where was it? Oh, it was in Oregon? Yeah, yeah, an Oregon man was arrested and jailed for building reservoirs on his property in order to collect rainwater. You heard it right. He was arrested. He was put in jail because he built reservoirs on his own property to collect rainwater from the sky. If you live in a nation where you're forbidden to collect rainwater on your own property, what kind of a nation do you live in? Now you have to ask yourself, I know you reasonable people are out there like, well, they must have had a reason for that. Maybe the rainwater was meant for the animals. Uh, no. What does it mean when you collect your own water? If you have ample drinking water for yourself and your family, what does that mean? It means that you don't have to be tied into the utility system. It means you don't have to rely on anyone else for your water, for life. Don't forget this, folks. I know it's 2013, but the human body still needs water each and every single day. And if try going 24 hours without it, you will not have a good day. Uh, it, it same. It was that way 2,000 years ago, 200 years ago, and it's, it's going to be the way it is until this big planet stops turning and we all go to our great reward. You need water. Why would you think that a government, that the state, would feel the need to arrest and jail a person for collecting rainwater 
Well, because he doesn't need the state, and we can't have that. Uh, we've got a California couple. Um, this just happened, April 2013. A California couple had their five-month-old child seized by the state after they took the infant to one hospital. The hospital told them that the child needed immediate surgery. And they're like, whoa, this is a five-month-old baby. We don't know if we want to put this child immediately under the knife. So they took their child. They went to a second hospital to get a second opinion from another doctor. And the second doctor is like, whoa, no, we're not going to put this kid under the knife right now. We're going to start other treatment. Well, what happens? The parents take their kid. They go home. Who shows up? The Gestapo. And if you don't like me using the term Gestapo, then stop breaking into people's houses and taking their five-month-old babies by force. Before you get butt hurt and write me letters about, you can't use the term Gestapo because that's inflammatory. You know what's inflammatory? Getting a call from a hospital saying, and they didn't get permission. Their, their crime was this couple did not get permission from the first hospital to take their child to get a second opinion. So hospital number one calls the police, calls child protective services and says, this family took their child and went somewhere else. You need to go get that child. So what do they do? There's, look it up. It's on the internet. And we'll put a link up for you guys who want to see it. But, uh, yeah, they went in. They're like, we're taking your child. There's no history of abuse. There's no evidence of abuse. But what do we see here? Is the state going to decide what your child needs as far as medical care and what it does not need? And uh, there's a, one more example. I'll, I'll talk, head on it real quick. Um, in uh, April 2013, a Christian family from Germany uh, who had come to the United States and sought asylum because they wanted to homeschool their children. Now, in Germany, it is illegal for you to homeschool your children. So they applied for asylum uh, in uh, the United States. They were granted asylum, and they brought their kids here, and they started uh, uh, homeschooling their children. Well, under a a 2011 Obama administration initiative, uh, uh, initiated a new policy called the Prosecutor prosecutorial discretion that gives the government broad powers to pursue high priority cases or it also gives the department of homeland security the power to decide which deportation proceedings it wishes to pursue let's go back and look at that again gives the department of homeland security the power to decide which deportation proceedings it wishes to pursue So what that means is, under the current rules, that the DHS can decide who it wants to deport and who it does not want to deport. Well, apparently in uh, 2013, the people that we need to get out of our country are white Christians from Germany who are homeschooling their children. Not so much the 10 million illegal aliens and the tens of thousands of felons who are currently populating the jails in Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and California who are in the United States illegally. Oh, oh, and not uh, Muslim terrorists in Boston who are in the country illegally. We're not going to deport them because that would be wrong. But what we're going to do is we're going to put the hammer down on this Christian family from Germany because why? What's their crime? Their crime is they're homeschooling their children. Well, if you homeschool your children, what does that mean? It means that you don't need the state. And getting all the way back around full circle, you need to understand this. Why is it that calling guns self-defense tools is not an effective defense against the anti-gun administration or anti-gun people in America today? Well, because self-defense tools are exactly the tools they don't want you to have. When you hear a uh, a governor or a mayor or some politician come out and say, nobody needs 10 rounds to shoot a deer, or you don't need an assault rifle to hunt deer. Hey, retard, it's not about hunting deer. But what what does that tell you? When you hear somebody like Kumo or Bloomberg or some other knucklehead telling you what you need and what you don't need, first of all, that insults me when people try and tell me what I need and what I don't need. But when they start throwing out this hunting thing, and if you're a hunter in the audience, rock on, dude, I'm a hunter. But I also know that the Second Amendment is not about hunting. And when someone tries to tell you, well, you don't need that for hunting, what they're de facto saying is, I believe that the state should allow you or should be allowed to tell you what you can and cannot possess. And you're allowed to have guns that you can play with, 
but you are not allowed to have guns that you can fight with. And that is the big question. That is the question you need to ask yourself. Is the state where I live, are they more concerned with my ability to play with guns or my ability, and when I say play, don't write me letters, but I don't play with guns. I'm a ser- Dudes, if you go out and you play a shooting sports game, whether it's cowboy action or Ipsic or whatever, it's a game. Games are fun. I like games. Everybody likes games and game, but they're sports. Hunting is a sport. It is a recreation. It's not fighting. When someone tells you that it's okay to have that kind of gun because it's all right for sporting use, but you can't have it because it's not for fighting, the whole purpose of the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution was not so you can go out and be free to play your favorite sport. That's not what it's about. So, you know, all the gun golfers out there, don't write me and tell me that, uh, you know, I'm not concerned about assault rifles because I have my, you know, Parazzi or whatever. That's not... The Second Amendment is for fighting guns. And when they tell you you're not allowed to have your fighting guns, what they're essentially telling you is that the state will give you permission or will deny you permission to possess it. Think about that. You, if you are an independent citizen, if you are a free thinker, if you have food and water and safe and shelter, if you have firearms that you could use to defend yourself and your family, you are an independent citizen. What does an independent citizen not need? Well, an independent citizen doesn't need the state to wipe their noses and clean their butts. And that's what they do. And, the state, and you know, it, it, we live in the United States of America. And right now, the United States of America is still an anomaly there. And you need to whether you believe it or not or whether you want to acknowledge it because it hurts your little brain. The state is trying really hard to correct this whole independent citizen nonsense Think about it. Right now, there are more people in the United States of America receiving some form of government assistance than at any time in the nation's history. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? And for those of you, if there's any of you listening to me right now that think, well, that's a good thing. The more people on government assistance, the better. You're a crazy person. Go listen to an NPR show because you you obviously made a mistake and you arrived here. Or hang out for a second and and listen up. You would think in a rational, reasonable world that the government would want its citizens to be as independent as possible, to be as free from the needs or the necessities of the government as possible. And you would think... Well, we know that that's what our founding fathers envisioned. Read your history, not revisionist history that's in the public schools today. You're going to have to search a little bit. But uh, but that's not it. Because why? It is simple as this. The state, whether it's Germany, whether it's Italy, France, England, the United States of America, Japan, you name it, the state is always in a constant struggle for supremacy over the populace. And generally, the state wins. Historically, the state always wins. Europe right now, all of the countries in Europe are populated with comfortable slaves. You know, that's what cracks me up when people from England try and weigh in on the American gun debate. And people from England try and tell us what we should and should not do. Dude, you're a comfortable slave. Go back to England and and pay your taxes and be a little comfortable slave and tell me you know, how great your life is. Because it's not comfortable to be an independent citizen. And that's something that we talked about uh, talked about earlier this week is the uh, the desire for absolute comfort leads directly to slavery. Independence can be uncomfortable. If you don't have, you know, the uh, the safety net to fall back on, independence can be uncomfortable. Slavery can be comfortable. I'll just do whatever the government tells me to do. They'll give me my check and they'll give me my utilities and my phone and everything, and I'll just be a comfortable slave. A comfortable slave is a slave nonetheless. So if you are an independent citizen, you are a threat to the state. However, the good news is we still have that pesky little Bill of Rights. We still have that Constitution. We have the roadmap for limited government. We have the roadmap. It's been laid out for us. It was put on paper 200 years ago. All we have to do is read it, understand it, apply it, and then lastly defend it. And that is up to each and every one of you within the sound, the listening sound of my voice right now.
Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we hope that you've enjoyed this week uh, on Student of the Gun Radio. I know we've gotten a little bit serious, but you know what? It is serious times. Time to be serious. I wish that we could just talk about playing and fun and hunting and, uh, you know, recreational activities. But right now in the United States of America, we need to make sure that uh, we uh, are dealing with the serious issues because if we ignore the serious issues, they're not going to go away. Now, as we do every single week, once this show is live, you can go over to Student of the Gun Radio and the links for all the stories that we talked about. You know, I don't just make this stuff up. <laughs> it act, We actually have source material for it. And we will put the source material up for all of you guys out there. Now, don't forget to support the people that support us. If you like Student of the Gun Radio, we couldn't do it without our sponsors. We could not do it without support from our friends at Crossbreed Holsters, and we could not do it without support of our friends of Keltec firearms and of course the firearms radio network so remember you're a beginner once but you should be a student for life 